So it's uh, six o'clock and I'd like to welcome uh, counselor staff and presenters as well as the public to the special meeting of council February the 11th, 2021. Uh, this is a virtual meeting, so we will be uh, live streaming through our website. And if you're unable to view it through the live stream this evening, it will be presented tomorrow on the YouTube channel. Um, this evening, we will be hearing presentations from the agencies, commissions, and boards uh, that serve uh, Midland and, uh, in some cases, Midland and area. And uh, we have uh, the basically there'll be ten minute presentation, followed by a um, ten minute question session. Sh uh, should we need that uh, from counselors to the presenter? Um, so uh, with that, I'll call the meeting, as I say, to order and uh, ask if there are any declarations of conflict of interest. Seeing none, um, I have a motion moved by Councillor Main, seconded by Councillor Prost, that the contents of the special meeting of council agenda for February 11th, 2021 be approved. Uh, all those in favor? Thank you, and that carries. We are now in, say, in session, and our first presenter is uh, Julie Cayley, who's the CEO of the Severn Sound Environmental Association. So, uh, Ms. Cayley, if you'd like to, uh, or Madam Clerk, if you could promote Ms. Cayley to the, uh, oh, there we go. Welcome. Looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I do have a slide deck as well. Thank you. Uh, I think somebody was sharing that. I think the clerk may be, or the deputy clerk. Yeah. Um, and um, if I may, uh, Your Worship, I'm going to defer to uh, Chair Walma from our organization just to start us off. I apologize, Your Worship. It's a little hard to hear, uh, unfortunately. <clears throat> All right. Can you guys hear me? Yep. I feel like I'm yelling. Uh, Your Worship, members of You're Council. You're very loud. Thank you, Councillor Walma. Deputy Mayor Walma. Uh, your worship, members of council, thank you very much for having us here today. Uh, I, uh, I don't want to take up too much of your time because I know we want to hear our, uh, our experts speak. Uh, with us, we have Julie Cayley, our executive director. I'm going to stick around for the presentation. Uh, if there are any questions that I can help handle, uh, I look forward to doing so. And hopefully, uh, uh, Councillor Gordon's background will, uh, will make it rain at the end of this presentation. <laughs> So uh, thank you. If I could have the next slide, please. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Great. I'm trying to hold my mic a little better. Uh, so hopefully we all know that uh, Severn Sound is the southeastern portion of Georgian Bay. Uh, our watershed goes from a, a tiny township in the west to Georgian Bay township in the east and as far south as the Horseshoe Valley Road approximately. Next slide, please. And we have uh, a Severn Sound Environmental Association was established in 1970, or sorry, 70, 97. And we became your joint municipal service board under the Municipal Act, um, a partnership of eight municipalities in 2009. You can see here on the slides. Um, and that's in, to manage environmental issues. And you really, you gain efficiency by sharing Severn Sound uh, as a resource enabling watershed management as the ED, I report to the board representing eight municipal members. I uh, want to thank your councillor, Carol McGinn, a current representative on our board for your continued support. The SSCA is also your source protection authority under the Ontario Clean Water Act. So one of two non-conservation authorities in the province who is uh, the source protection authority. So that's part of your multi-barrier approach to protecting municipal drinking water sources. Next slide, please. And through our team, the town of Midland can access uh, a variety of expertise. We have six full-time permanent at the moment, three contract, one part-time. I do want to mention that we have left two uh, vacancies in 2020 in order to try to reduce our costs during these challenging times. We were fortunate enough to get funding for six seasonal staff through Canada Summer Jobs. Next slide, please. And like all businesses, COVID certainly had a significant impact on both our operations and our budget and our team 
continues to work remotely right now, um, but has done a really amazing job at pivoting our programs and continuing to deliver on the shared goals and shared services. Next slide, please. So just briefly in terms of some of the highlights from 2020, one of the areas we really had to pivot was with this source water protection, including uh, developing a protocol to do virtual site visits. The, the show had to go on around protecting drinking water, obviously. Um, we've helped work with the town staff meeting your annual provincial government reporting requirements, and we're on track to complete 16 required risk management plans within the town by the July 2020 provincial deadline. And our staff were also instrumental in helping get that deadline um, moved ahead a bit. Next slide, please. Within our water quality monitoring programs, um, we tried to continue these. They were delayed due to the provincial government closing their labs, uh, obviously early in, in the COVID pandemic. But we continued with water quality in Little Lake, open water in Midland Bay and Tiffin Bay, streams and groundwater monitoring. And the staff really modified program and were really innovative in making sure we could continue to, to collect data in these. Um, we do also do climate monitoring. Again, some delay, but uh, we have a new weather station installed at the Midland Sewage Treatment Plant, and that's a partnership with Tay and Penetanguishene as well. We also had to enhance our citizen science programs to make sure we weren't missing any data and observation collection. So a new shore watch and stream watch program with three new Midland volunteers. And we continue to maintain the water level gauge at the Midland Town Dock, which is obviously critical to both the grain and cruise ship traffic. Next slide, please. And we were able to support the North Simcoe mayors, including your mayor, um, at a successful AMO delegation to the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry regarding the impacts of extreme Georgian Bay water levels on shoreline communities. Um, we did have to cancel our 2020 tree programs, unfortunately, but those are ramping back up for 2021. Um, and uh, certainly had an increase in our online and video fact sheet, all those types of resources. And I think we're gonna continue to see that with our invasive species program. Next slide, please. So looking ahead at our work plans, obviously the pieces I've talked about will continue and certainly the things that we have to do to maintain our commitments. The Drinking Water Source Protection Program, there's provincial deadlines, as I mentioned, regulatory deadlines that we're helping our, our partners meet in, the, in 2022. Um, habitat assessment review and input. We're currently working um, with your incredible staff to identify needs uh, and a strategic path really to move forward together. Stewardship projects, like I mentioned, tree planting and tree distribution is a go for 2021. So we'll probably be looking again to folks within the municipalities to help us uh, distribute trees, um, probably curbside pickup uh, happening this spring. We will obviously continue our monitoring programs as well, including Little Lake. And uh, we're looking at hosting another one of the Great Lakes Revival webinars we did where we were looking at the value in, of investing uh, in Severn Sound. Next slide, please. Our invasive species program is continuing. That's now part of our core work and uh, management management, management and training, monitoring, I should say, and a new zebra mussel monitoring tool that we're going to be putting into Little Lake. Um, 2021 was the first full year we had sustainable Severin Sound or SSS, as some of you may know it, operating as a special project within SSEA, combining the two uh, program areas. And project staff, we were very fortunate that Tracy was willing to come over with the program to us. Uh, delivering information services on climate change actions to help implement your municipal climate plans. And our team is providing support to your staff in the B City Canada program with a virtual workshop plan for March. Also working to prepare a five year GHG emissions analysis for our partners, which include you at Midland. And continuing to meet your partners in climate protection uh, PCP program membership requirements. We're also looking to start the development of a watershed scale climate resilience plan and um, have already started to talk to your staff about exploring um, a watershed natural, uh, natural asset inventory and evaluation. Next slide, please. So you have in front of you our request for 2021, um, the total at the top of 161 to 86, and then the breakdown uh, between the core operations, our risk management, uh, drinking water source protection services, the Little Lake water quality piece, which is a special project, the tree distribution program, which is no uh, direct cost to the town. We uh, look for in-kind help, uh, particularly in the distribution, and then the sustainable Severn Sound project, uh, which has a slight reduction in cost uh, this year, uh, but we've been fortunate, like I mentioned, to be able to continue with uh, Tracy staying on with us. 
So I know that was quick. I'm going to leave it at that. And uh, next slide, please. I just would really like to thank you for your ongoing support and know we have a lot of work to do ahead together and uh, we'll be looking to your staff to help provide us with some direction as well. Thank you. You're muted, Your Worship. I think after all this time, I'd, le I'd learned where that button was. Councillor Gordon, please. And then I think, did I see Councillor Main there? Thank you. Thanks for your presentation. Um, you guys definitely do good work. Um, I, along with many people, have probably been reading some of the pushback that our neighboring councils have done about some of the, the core increases in your costs. Uh, some of which involved, as I understand, requirements to stop, you know, using loaner vehicles and to acquire your own, uh, amongst some other upgrades, some technical like IT upgrades that we're faced with uh, the same challenges here in town. I'm just wondering, though, based on this current budget, and, and by the way, if I just misstated anything, please correct me after. Um, based on this current budget request, what role are you going to be able to play in helping us manage our keys problem in Little Lake Park? as well as the town dock area, and of course the feces that uh, you know come from the geese, <laughs> as well as the blue-green algae, and I don't know if it's directly related or not, uh, blooms that we're having a little like, I, I'm just wondering if that's kind of like, those services are all in with this request and if we could expect some, uh, some of your expertise in helping us manage these two problems, amongst others, of course, but. Uh, through your worship to Councillor Gordon, um, thank you. Excellent questions. And so uh, specific to the goose management, um, your, uh, your town's staff have already approached us on that question um, and have asked us to think about where we could work with you and uh, create a str so some strategic options, I would say, moving forward so we can certainly help do some of the research around that um, and hopefully help get some options to move you forward. Um, the second piece you spoke to was the blue green algae. Uh, that particular issue, particularly in Little Lake, um, obviously was help, dealt with last year through the health unit, uh, the Ministry of Environment. Um, we do have a person on staff who can do early detection and identification. She has the, the skills and um, is often used when Ministry of Environment or the health unit can't get there quick enough. So we can certainly look to, uh, to be trying to help monitor earlier for that um, in, in this coming year. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to be out in the field more than we were this past year. Um, and to answer your question around budget, those two things um, currently are in the budget that's in front of you. Um, in particular, any of the monitoring around Little Lake is included in that, the Little Lake piece. Um, and working with staff to figure out uh, a goose management, some options moving forward at, at the time with what we understand will probably be included in your existing, uh, the budget ask you have in front of you as well. Thank you. Uh, Councillor May. Well, I just want to thank you guys for all the hard work. Um, uh, touch on a couple of points. Um, I, I think that's a great idea moving uh, the invasive species into a core program. It seemed to be a very successful program that you guys uh, implemented the uh, last couple of years. I know it's something that all of us here in North Simcoe and all of us in the watershed, because again, I think that's really important to, to notice that, that the SSEA is not just a North Simcoe organization. It's a watershed based approach and it's much leaner and more efficient than conservation authorities. It's its own unique entity. Uh, so thank you so much for all of that. Um, uh, but yeah, the invasive species is critical. And I think the real thing that I would highlight for our other neighbors is you are basically our sustainability department. You know, having the uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation, I think is gonna be another area where we're gonna really uh, need to increase uh, participation. So thank you so much for, uh, over the last many years, identifying that the two organizations perhaps could be better as one. And, and I know it took a lot of work to get that up and running. And we very, I'm very, very thankful of Tracy, all her hard work. And uh, it's been uh, just a great initiative to start. Think of how you already started just doing a little bit of water sampling to now evolve to where you are. I think it's been a great success story. So thank you again for all of the hard work and water science. I mean, this is the year of science. So thank you for all of the science that you provided us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor McGinn. Well, thank you. Um, I really should attempt to uh, put up my request to speak before Councillor Main because uh, 
I feel a little bit uh, as if it's, you know, easy for me to say, you know, to echo what Councillor Main said. Um, so to echo what Councillor Main said and add that I want to thank you for being so involved and inclusive and um, for um, always making sure that you're, you're being accessible and you're being available and for how you interact and how there's the education piece as well. Um, and that that is something you're not only doing with us, but uh, you've got social media platforms where even my own children are going to them. So I see the investment in us now. I see the investment in our friends, family and neighbors, and I see our investment in the future. Um, thank you very much for that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Further questions or comments from council from Ms. Kaylee? I don't see any. I'd just like to make a couple comments myself. First, uh, from what I've seen over the last few years, uh, Severance Sound Environmental has moved from a, um, has moved towards a more structured management centric uh, procedural based organization. They've uh, gone from borrowing vehicles, their fleet from whichever municipality had one to loan to a dedicated fleet, which uh, is, uh, uh, I think, wise. Uh, they've taken on, they've recognized that they had some liabilities. I believe one of them was uh, uh, well holes, bore holes. And uh, that decommissioning these is going to, is an, ex, was an ex, is an expense that's coming up for which there were no reserves. So they're also building reserves for liabilities that the municipalities have taken on. And I think that uh, there's no disputing the caliber of the work that's being done. And finally, uh, what I listened to some of the conversations at county regarding conservation authorities, I feel very blessed that we have the Severn Sound Environmental Association and not a conservation authority. No offense to conservation authorities, but. So I just would like to pass that along as my observations over time. I think John, uh, Councillor Maine would say the same. I'm sure Councillor McGinn would, I think we all would. So thank you for uh, the caliber of work. Thank you for transitioning into a more managed procedural based and probably more effective uh, organization in the long haul. And we wish you uh, all the best in going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much, Your Worship Council. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you very evening. much. Thank you. Always a pleasure, Deputy Mayor. Good seeing you. Good to see you too. See you guys. Our next presenter is um, Ms. Nahani Bourne from the, um, sorry, I don't think that's correct. Um, the next presenter, I believe, is from the uh, Hironi Airport, if I'm not mistaken. Am I correct in that, uh, Madam Clerk? That's correct, yeah. And the presenter is? Uh, Adam Rigdon, and um, who's the airport manager? as well as um, Mr. Cooper, board chair. Thank you. And uh, can, if you can promote them to panelists and we'll, we'll start. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. I don't see my smiling face, but oh, there I am <clears throat> up here in the corner. I don't know how that's got there, but I guess it's better than a cat face. So <clears throat> where's that? And, and, <laughs> where's um, you need to turn your camera on, I guess. Is your camera oh, on? There we go. That could be the problem. Okay. Sorry about that. Hey, Rigman, welcome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good evening, all. Start I will remind you, we have 10 minutes for your presentation and then about 10 minutes for any council, uh, any council questions. Looking forward to the presentation. Okay. Uh, your Worship and Council, Cooper. good evening. I'm, I'm Don Cooper, Chair of the Airport Commission. And uh, Adam's with me. He's ma manager of the airport. So you have the, you have the top brass here to uh, tell you that you're looking at your airport from a from an airplane in this picture. Uh, and even in spite of uh, COVID-19, uh, it's been a more active than usual airport this year. Uh, we're, run, we're run by a commission of seven people, three of which are from Midland. And we think we have a very capable group. 
the Lumex report on the airport has recently be, been presented to council. So some of the issues we're gonna be discussing tonight will be a, a familiar to you. I wanna talk briefly about opportunities we're pursuing and quite a few of them are, are in line with the Lumex recommendations. And the Lumex recommendations, I guess, first were made to, known to us almost a year ago. So we've had time to, to digest them and we're now beginning to, to work on them. Can I see the next slide, please? Okay. Uh, this is a bit, bit of really good news. Um, Xtreme Aviation is making Hironi Airport their home. They're conducting uh, an increasing number of flight lessons. They have 20 students uh, who regularly fly out of Huronia uh, going for their pilot's license. Uh, they have a Rotax repair center, which now occupies one of our large main hangars. The repair center is the only one in Ontario and therefore it's quite busy. The owner is, uh, is very anxious to de develop a major ultralight facility at the airport, uh, quite a big undertaking and a big, uh, a big building that he's, he's uh, planning to build. And the only thing I've had a discussion with him recently and the only thing that's holding him back is he's a bit nervous about the COVID situation and he wants to wait till things become a bit clearer on that. Uh, one other major development that's likely to happen is a major manufacturing operation. Uh, it's confidential at this stage. We can't tell you very much about it, except to note that the five-year plan calls for expansion to a 200,000 square, 200, square foot facility. Uh, there are lots of details to be worked out, uh, obviously with a plan this big, uh, and involvement of our three owners will definitely be required in, in getting this uh, opportunity resolved. There's a projection of 200 jobs that would be uh, part of this package. So we're quite excited about that. Uh, those are the two main uh, opportunities we're pursuing. Uh, and I'm gonna hand it over to Adam now who can take you through the rest of the report. Thank you, Don. Good evening, everyone. And thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak tonight. Despite being a challenging year, uh, Huroni Airport has very, some very sound successes in 2020. Uh, uh, when you speak about ultralights, uh, that's, a, that's an ultralight aircraft that you're looking at right now, not, um, not the lawn chair with the weed whacker engine on it, that ultralight aircraft uh, kind of is viewed as. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? <clears throat> uh, we had two, two major additions um, to the airport this year with the support from our uh, three municipal owners. Uh, first one was uh, 10, uh, 10 partially serviced building lots uh, for purposes of leasing. Uh, they're suitable for uh, 50 by 50 foot hangars. Um, that's in the red circle there to the left. Um, we also have a new high volume above ground fuel system <clears throat> uh, that replaces our 30 year old underground system that had been uh, had reached its end of life. It was fully operational as of uh, December 2020. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Tonight we're here to provide you the 10,000 foot view of uh, Huroni Airport's operations. This picture is actually taken of the airport from 10,000 feet. Can I have the next slide, please? So despite being a pandemic year, uh, Huroni Airport has had a relatively good year and has managed to provide uh, the majority of services that we offer. Uh, as you can see from the graphs, our, our movements are up 17% to almost 6,000 in total for the year. And our fuel sales were up 59% to a total of almost 92,000 liters sold last year. Our fuel sales and aircraft movements have doubled since 2009, which was the first year we started uh, accumulating statistics. We currently have 50 resident aircraft housed in both private and airport owned hangars. 
<clears throat> the staff completed in excess of 400 hours of combined grass cutting and snow removal, uh, which we spent all day today doing as well. We have cleared approximately an acre and a half of brush and trees that were encroaching on our approaches, which is an ongoing process. And we're gonna continue that in, uh, ne in next year. Huroni has a very small but dedicated staff of two full-time, one part-time and two part-time casual employees who are basically available 24 seven because we do get called out in the case of emergencies. Uh, total wages, um, and benefits for 2020 for staff was about $146,000 in total. Next slide, please. Oh, there. 2020 saw a worldwide curse known as COVID-19. Here on the airport is no different than any other public or private uh, entity. And we've suffered some significant setbacks this year. Can I have the next slide, please? These are the most significant implications to the airport um, last year. Uh, the Airport Management Council of Ontario, or AMCO, had selected Huroni to hold its 2020 spring workshop, generally attended by approximately 250 delegates representing airports from all over the province, international, national, regional, and municipal airports. Um, we had hotel rooms blocked and events were being planned in all three of owner municipalities. We had four scheduled events uh, that are free to the general public and all attendees. Um, they included fly-ins, a motorcycle swap meet, and even a wedding. These were all canceled. As an example of the influence of these events, results of a survey completed by Simcoe County Tourism regarding a 2019 event that was jointly sponsored by two local groups resulted in a single day economic impact of $20,000 in the excess of $20,000 for the local area. Our terminal remained, was closed and remains closed to all but essential access. Uh, we did manage to keep our uh, public washroom facilities open, which is good news in this area because there isn't too many close. All of our local service groups who use the terminal were forced to cancel all monthly meetings and events. Our traffic from the US and most of our commercial tr jet traffic ceased. Canada Border Services Agency suspended our CAN Pass on-site custom services. One positive note is we have noticed a, a substantial increase of, in use of our outdoor areas, both by aviation and non-aviation users. People fly in, drive in, bike in, and walk in. Next slide, please. So this is a, a quick snapshot of our uh, 2021 budget. Our total operating budget for 2021 is 372,818. Approximately two thirds of our budget is generated by land leases, fuel sales, charged and charges to itinerant aircraft. Big ticket expenses as shown are salaries, maintenance and our general expenses. Uh, the airport commission managed to achieve a 0% increase to our annual contribution request from the municipalities uh, for our operational budget. <clears throat> this year, the total contribution request is $137,271 divided by the breakup breakdown as shown. And um, we also managed to keep our minimum, uh, our capital funding request to a mi an absolute minimum as well. Next slide, please. <clears throat> These are our um, three primary pieces of equipment that we use here at the airport. Um, all pieces of equipment are in excess of 20 years old and they have a total combined hours of 28,000 hours. The request for capital assistance is for the replacement of one of our key pieces of equipment, the Michigan loader up in the top right hand corner, which is primarily used for snow removal. It's no longer economically viable to repair should a major breakdown occur. Service and maintenance uh, items are obsolete and no longer available. Can I have the next slide, please? As Don mentioned earlier, um, these charts are excerpts from the strategic development plan from the Lumix group that was re recently presented to the council as a whole. 
there's a couple of numbers on here that I really want to point out and emphasize. Um, when you're looking at the annual operations budget, the per capita cost of $3.07 or less than a penny per day per resident uh, in Huronia's catchment area. The other impressive number is the airport's total economic impact to the area shown to be in excess of $3 million. Can I have the next slide, please? One minute, yes? please. One minute, please. Okay. Uh, just very briefly, this is typical of uh, the tip, the traffic that we see at the airport on a normal day in a normal year. The center being the, the most popular, which is a general, general aviation aircraft that results in most of our traffic. Next slide, please. Once again, thank you for your attention. And Don and I would be pleased to answer any questions that you may have at this time. Thank you, Mr. Rigdon. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. Uh, council, questions for the uh, Council Maine. Uh, thanks so much for the presentation. Uh, yeah, uh, the Lumex report is just uh, such a magnificent report to go through. It's quite an extensive thing. Uh, long overdue to have a great comprehensive uh, report done on the airport. Uh, so looking through the report and looking and hearing your presentation, what are some of the uh, things to look forward for 2021? We heard a lot about what you guys did last year. What are some of the things that you guys are going to be doing this year? Thank you. I care to answer that. Mr. Cooper, you're on mute. Still on mute. There we go. Okay. I think the two opportunities that I spoke of, uh, really one is in midstream. We have about a third of what we anticipate would be required for the extreme aviation flight school uh, ultralight um, club has been talked of. Um, perhaps the, the major Canadian club for ultralights uh, being put in place on the, on the uh, airport facilities. Uh, so that's one thing. And uh, the industrial thing we're very excited about. And we have a couple of other um, interesting possibilities. There's an electrical contractor uh, who's interested in uh, locating at the airport. And uh, we're, we're looking into, although it's a long, it's a long term uh, possibility, but uh, clean soil deliveries to site at the south end of the site to build up that end of the site for possible runway renovation work. Um, that is a money making potential, but it would be clean soil. And we need to, uh, we need to probably take a year or two to come to the, the, the assessment of whether we can go ahead with that project. So we have a, a lot of things on the work and we've had a number in the past. We, for example, we had a, a, a solar park initiative that was just timed perfectly for the province to shut down all the solar, the solar energy in the initiatives that were going on. So we're always looking, um, but I think we have a couple of very good possibilities. And uh, yeah, we're very excited about what's uh, likely to happen next year. Thank you, for, thank you very much. Mr. Rigdon, you had something you wanted to say? I was just gonna say, we also have several, um, several more uh, people lined up who are interested in building hangars at the airport, which will expand our customer base. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Gordon presentation and uh, the information that's in our draft budget. Um, I'm just wondering about your land lease rates. Um, I'm assuming that's probably your, your main way of, of you know, making money. Um, are they considered market rates uh, or are they discount by today's uh, standards and how often do these uh, leases renew? Um, I guess really what I'm trying to get, get to is are you guys generating the optimal amount of income from the tenants to offset capital, the support that we give you as owners? And can you see any new ways to capitalize off this new growth that it sounds like uh, you're attracting? And I'm just hoping it's not being attracted by cheap rates. Uh, no, no. Um, really, uh, the rates that we're charging um, for having private hangars, for example, on the, on the premises um, is, is quite competitive uh, with other airports in terms of leasing of land. Um, but uh, we are looking very carefully into uh, what, 
what rates we would charge for really quite major facilities that um, we're hoping to uh, come to grips with next year. And it would not be the private hangar rates at all. It would probably be uh, a multiple, a large multiple of those rates that we would be using for land leases. And in fact, there may be, there may be the possibility of uh, selling the land on which facilities would be built. And there's a possibility of uh, possibly uh, an industrial park uh, because our zoning is such that we could entertain that sort of thing. Uh, so yes, we're looking at a lot of options and uh, none of them would be, would be the, the lease rates would be many times what they are for what, what we are leasing at the moment. Hope that answers your question. Councilor Gordon. Thank you, it does. Um, it's, it sounds good. I mean, it really does. I mean, it, one of the things that was raised during that report was uh, the hazard, maybe I'm not using the right terminology, on the, the runway slope, because there's a bit of a dip, dipsy doodle at one end. And I'm just wondering if that's impacted your insurance uh, rates. And if so, how long do we have to fix that? Or is it more of like a, you know, a, a sidebar thing that's not really something we need to pay attention to right away? Just wondering how hazardous is that? Clearly people are crashing, but you know. Uh, I'm gonna let Ad Adam answer that one. Uh, for, I'd also like to comment on your question about capital. Uh, Councillor Gordon, um, we do have an infrastructure fee that we do charge new hangar owners that come to the site to help recoup the capital costs that are invested to develop those sites. Uh, as far as the, um, the, the runway slope, um, in order to take the, the slope out of that runway is a, is a, is a very major capital cost. Um, we have to do a very serious cost benefit analysis to see whether it's worth doing or not. Um, but we can also mitigate the, the, the safety or improve the safety by extending our taxiway a lot. The biggest problem is, is you can't see the entire runway um, from, the, from the approaches to the runway. So if we extend our taxiway slightly, we can see basically both ends of the runway from all areas in the airport. So that would mitigate the, uh, this, the danger situation or the, the risk situation. And, and with regards to the question of your insurance, no, we, it's, we've seen no, um, no issues with that. Yeah, maybe I could just add, it, it's, it, the, the danger situation is, is planes entering onto the runway, not being able to see the south end of the runway. And so if a plane was preparing to take off potentially a uh, uh, plane coming onto the runway could be in danger. Extending the taxiway would allow the entry to the runway to be in full view of the entire runway. So removing that danger. Thank you, John. Made it very clear to me, thank you very much. Uh, Councilor Shevsky. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, this is something I'm uh, very proud to be part of. Uh, thank you guys for having me on the board. This has been a great uh, year and change so far. And uh, I think it's great to see uh, during such a challenging time, we've been expanding our customer base and expanding uh, business. We still have people knocking on the door looking to come to the airport. And uh, that's not a story that a lot of businesses are having right now. So I commend you guys and uh, the rest of the board for that. And this, the other municipalities as well. Um, I think it's great. We've got great opportunities ahead uh, once we can start opening things back up in terms of um, the, some of the events that we had planned and some of the uh, conferences that we have opportunities to host. So I'm really excited for the future of the airport. And uh, I think the big thing to look at in the slide deck was the 10% uh, of um, our economic impact to the community is our operating budget. So uh, 10 times our operating budget is the economic impact of the community. So I think we're a bargain and uh, I might be a little biased, but I think we're doing great things and uh, really excited for the future. I think we have great opportunities um, in terms of rates. Yes, we do have competitive um, rental rates. I think our fuel rates are, um, are great. And uh, I think that does draw people here. So I think it's great that we're doing so well. Um, really looking forward to the future without speaking on behalf of the board. I'd love to see uh, some rebranding and some, public education around the airport and uh, better educate our residents on what we do at the airport and uh, let them know about the economic drivers and the economic asset that we are 
and uh, something I'm very proud to be part of and something I'll uh, help drive home. And uh, thank you so much for your presentation. It was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Shevsky. Any other comments or questions from Council? Uh, sorry, Councillor Cunningham. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. And thank you for bringing that presentation. I have a question around this ultralight flight school. I think it's exciting. I think it's unique and it's going to make our area stand out. I wonder if it will add to or detract from the idea of a traditional flight school. I, my instinct is it would add to it, um, but from a space standpoint at the airport, can you share how those might work together? Uh, I'm going to let Adam address that. He's more tuned into the tubing and well, throwing on that one. As I said, um, when extremes, the picture of extremes aircraft was up, um, when you talk about ultralight aircraft to a lot of people, the vision of a lawn chair with balloons and a weed whacker motor strapped to it is what comes into people's minds. Um, that particular aircraft is not, a, is not what I would consider to be an ultralight. Um, it's very similar to most general aviation uh, aircraft. It's very stable, very, I've flown with uh, the owner. Um, it's very stable. It's, it's a fun, fun aircraft to fly. Um, and it fits in very well with any general um, general aviation type um, movement. Um, so it's, it's, there's really no conflict there. I, I would recommend that to all of you that to come out to the airport, drop by the airport sometime. Bill loves to show off his equipment, loves to show off his facilities, and I'd love to show off the facility to anybody who wants to come out. So feel free to drop by anytime. Wear, wear, wear your mask and we'll show you around. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Rigdon. Any other comments or questions from council? I have a question and a comment, I guess. The first, I guess, would be around the um, aging fleet of uh, vehicles and whether you are trying to create reserves to replace that fleet over time. I'm, I'm assuming it's a fairly short window that you have to uh, within which to build a reserve because of the age of the, the vehicles. I don't know that. And the second would be a caution around soil storage. Uh, I, there are numerous stories of municipalities who have done soil storage. Uh, supposedly the soil was uh, met rigorous uh, uh, clean standards, only to find out they didn't in the end. Uh, massive cleanup costs. And, and I, I'm assuming uh, you will build in the appropriate safeguards, but also uh, you'll speak with the owner group before doing something like that. So those are my two comments, a question and a comment. Yeah, no, uh, definitely uh, we're going to proceed carefully <coughs> on the soil situation for sure. And we would want to have uh, involvement of, of our owners in that process. And the reserve on your aging fleet? Um, we will, uh, we have a plan to systematically replace things and, and part of the capital budget this year plus uh, a remainder from last year will enable us to replace one of those uh, items of equipment. And we have uh, plans as well for, for a backup situation if any one of the three fail. So we, we have covered the situation, but we're, we're, we will slowly recover uh, to more up-to-date equipment. I see. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. It's oh, Councillor Gordon. Last question to you. It's a, a quick thing about well, ultralight. I mean, I think uh, it was a long time ago. I took my ground school and almost got my private. I just ran out of money back in college. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's a lot cheaper. Uh, I won't say less effort, but less expensive, I think it is, to, to go through flight school for an ultralight license, right? They've changed the way the private pilot licensing works. So it's it's actually achievable and not really uh, um, the same as, you know, it's not a place to get a commercial uh, license, but uh, if you want basic training to fly, it's, it's something that's quite affordable, as I'm led to believe, because of the way the licensing changed in the past decade. Maybe you could speak to that a bit, because it's something that perhaps people that I've always just wondered, well, hey, maybe I'd like to fly. If this is something they could avail themselves of locally rather than having to go to the Barry Airport or some other airport, that would be, like, that's good for the local economy. Adam, could you handle that one, please? 
Well, it's um, it's building blocks. Uh, yes, they have changed the rules significantly in the last decade or so about uh, licensing. Uh, you actually, it's called a pilot permit, not a pilot license. And there is there is some restrictions, but it is a very much more affordable way to get into aviation. Um, and a good number of the hours that um, are uh, accumulated during your getting your ultralight license or advanced ultralight license can be used towards private and commercial licenses in the future. So yes, it is a much more affordable route to start. Um, and there are people who start and just decide it's not for them. So rather than laying out a whole bunch of money to get started, and um, it's a good way to start and find out whether you like the, like the hobby or not, so. <clears throat> Thanks, Thank you, gentlemen. I'm, I'm gonna have friend, to... Sorry, just, just part of that last part, can you, if someone wanted to get their training at the airport and doesn't wanna, you know, spend whatever it is, 30 grand or something for an ultralight airplane, can you rent an airplane after you get your, your, your license from the airport? Well, fly? Extreme Extreme has three brand new aircraft on order from a company in the Czech Republic. And that's his intention is to offer them up for, for rental purposes afterwards. So it would be like renting a snowmobile from your local snowmobile guy or a boat from the local marina. So yes, that's definitely going to be a possibility. Hey, thank you very much. Sorry to sidebar here a bit. <laughs> that's okay. So I, I, I'll um, offer our thanks for your presentation and we'll certainly consider uh, the budget request uh, thoughtfully and uh, have, hope, wish you a, a great evening and uh, and the best of uh, successes with uh, the opportunities that seem to be coming your way. So thank you, gentlemen. Okay. Thank you very much for having thank us. You. Thank, thank you. you. Good, night. Good night. I believe our next presenter is the Heronia um, Museum and the presenter will be uh, Oh, no, Your Worship, it's actually um, the Midland Public Library. Uh -huh. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, so the Midland Public Library, it will be a video presentation. Uh, I see the CEOs here uh, with a special guest. Um, yeah, Madison, as I recall. And so I, I believe Madam Clerk will be seeing a video. Do you want to introduce the video, Ms. Witzke? Uh, or sorry. Uh, Oh dear, I'm having a seniors moment here. I can't remember your married name. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> My apologies to Lyle <laughs> and to you. Um, do you wish to introduce the, uh, the video or should we just proceed? You're on mute. Is that better? That's better. There we go. So this year with COVID, we wanted to make it a little bit easier and prevent any possible technical difficulties. So um, we do have our presentation is filmed as a video for you. Just one second. Um, and then we'll be live for questions after that. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, I think the deputy clerk has the video, if I'm not mistaken. We'll take a moment to load. Worship, Council, and Town staff for the opportunity to present the proposed 2021 operating budget for the Midland Public Library. My name is Roberta Ball and I am the Chair of the Midland Public Library Board. And I'm Crystal Bergstrom, CEO and Chief Librarian at the Midland Public Library. Each year we come to you to share the successes and value of the library for the community as well as to present our draft operating budget for the coming year. We've utilized the pandemic to transform and evolve the library like never before. The pandemic has highlighted the need for and value of libraries in communities around the world. During the pandemic, our staff worked quickly to transition all of our programming to an online platform to continue to provide services and resources to keep our community engaged, informed, and connected. I applaud our staff for their dedication 
in transitioning the entire platform of library services to an online environment in such an expedient manner. Not only did they work out systems for ensuring patron engagement for our standard programs, such as the Summer Reading Club, but they also used this opportunity to branch out into so many other new and exciting programs and services, such as... We also doubled our loanable Wi-Fi hotspot collection, a collection that has proven to be a hugely needed resource in our community. The feedback for this collection has been overwhelming, including one patron who noted, your Wi-Fi hotspot loans are the reason my daughter can do her homework and the reason my husband kept his job. In addition to our online programming and services, curbside services and increased collections, our staff also works to reach out to potentially isolated seniors and residents. These calls provide a connection to many who might be struggling with the pandemic conditions. Our library staff were also able to utilize our MakerPlace technology to 3D print PPE for healthcare providers and volunteers. The board was also hard at work during the pandemic. The board utilized their wide skill base to undertake the lengthy process of creating our new 2021-2025 strategic plan. Thanks to the new system of skills-based recruitment for the library board, this project was able to be completed in-house, eliminating the need for costly consultants to do this work on our behalf. This saved thousands of dollars for the library. We are also very proud that the town and library system of board member recruitment is a trailblazer in the province for board recruitment and is often referred to by the ministry as a prime example for other libraries and municipalities. MPL is also a proud member of the Simcoe County Library Cooperative. Each year, this cooperative provides value to the library and residents of our community. Of the many benefits we receive from the county cooperative, the most notable are the over $200,000 in software, databases, and electronic resources that we have full access to. We also receive full IT support, connectivity, and wireless services, as well as our ILS system, resources worth well over $250,000 for our library and community. Our staff and board worked very hard this past year to secure other forms of funding including receiving over $15,000 in grants to help offset new costs experienced due to the pandemic. Our board vice chair also raised over $4,000 for the library through her handmade mask campaign. As is the norm, in preparing the proposed library budget, there are a few lines that are beyond the control of the library board. These include insurance rates, utilities, as well as wages and benefits, since the library sit on the town pay grids. This year, the predicted increases in these areas are 4.5% from our 2020 approved operating budget. With this knowledge in mind, we worked diligently to ensure the remainder of our budget continued to be as frugal and carefully planned as possible, while still ensuring quality services and resources to the community. Despite the loss of various areas of revenue in 2020 due to the closures required from the pandemic, the library actually saved money in 2020 and will close out the fiscal year with a small 
surplus due to streamlining of expenses wherever possible. For 2021, you will see that our proposed total budget is $1,271,660, which translates into a 2% increase, lower than the municipally directed and COVID impacted increases predicted for 2021. The fact is Midland loves its library. Since 2016, the library's programs, services, and membership have increased drastically and our active membership rate for our Midland residents is among the best in the province and country. The town of Midland and the Midland Public Library are now leaders in the library field, a fact our board and staff are very proud of. We've seen steady growth in program and service offerings, memberships, program attendance, and circulation. This phenomenal growth is due to the dedication and tireless efforts of all of our staff members. They are working well beyond their job descriptions to cover additional tasks related to the increase in services and programs. With the 2021 budget, the Library Board is requesting a service level enhancement for a full-time marketing and communications coordinator position. The fulfillment of this long overdue position will allow staff to continue to focus their efforts on providing the best quality services and programs that they have worked so hard to establish these last four and a half years without burnout. For example, in 2015, we offered approximately 125 programs and now close out annually with approximately 1,000 programs. Since 2018, our annual community survey respondents have also continued to provide comments on the need for increased communication and marketing of our events and our services. This direct community feedback indicates that despite the diligent efforts of our staff, more support is needed in the area of marketing and communications. While we still don't know what the future may hold for our community, one thing is certain. The Midland Public Library is ready to move forward. We're ready to tackle this new year and launch many new and exciting programs and initiatives for our community. We thank you for the opportunity to present our draft operating budget to you. We'd also like to take this opportunity to thank all town staff for their help and support again this past year. This is the place. This is the place. This is the place. I'm still on mute. Somebody put me on mute. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Love the uh, presentation. And uh, I swear, Councillor Gordon, it wasn't me to put myself on mute that time. <laughs> uh, Council, you have, uh, uh, here we go, Councillor Maine. Thank you so much uh, for the wonderful presentation. It was a little bit glitchy, but I think we got all the information and I certainly understand the passion that all the library staff bring to it. I really miss going into the library every time I'm downtown and you walk past there, you go, oh, like, it's so weird that you just can't go in. And I, again, huge kudos to uh, be able to adapt last year uh, and be able to provide services. Um, the question I had for um, the presentation was, it wasn't clear on, so you're obviously you're talking about there's a, um, a staffing wage increases is one statistic. It's pegged at about 4.5%. Obviously the operating budget is at two. I just wasn't sure if the uh, request for the marketing uh, and communication coordinator, was that a separate ask or is that included in the um, staffing 4.5%? Um, uh, is that included in that or is that a separate item? Thank you so much. This would, uh, Bergstrom. <laughs> Through you, your worshipped Councillor Maine. Um, yes, thank you. So sorry about the technical difficulties. I'm not sure what was happening there. Um, I can always send you a link to see it fabulous another time. 
Um, so the staffing um, wages and benefits increases were predicted to be about 4.5%. That's, that's a big increase from our 2020 operating budget. So what the board and I did was we went through and streamlined as much as we could, reducing it down to 2% overall. Now, the marketing and communications coordinator, coordinator position is a new position. So it's a new ask. So it's a service level enhancement request. So that would be over and above the 2%. Um, there was, we tried, but there was just no way for us to squeeze it in um, into that 2%. Just, so just for further uh, clarification, um, sorry, getting all percentages all mixed up here. So is that 4.5% wage increase included in the 2% um, operational increase? Through you, your worship. Yes, I know it's a little confusing. So if we had just left our budget the same as last year and just added on the wage and benefit increases, it would have been a 4.5% ask. We weren't happy with that number. We wanted to streamline that. So we reduced in other areas to offset that, reducing that 4.5% down to two. Okay, thank you so much for clarifying that. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor Ross. Thank you very much, Your Worship. Through you to our CAO of the library. How are you today? Thank you. I hope your, your family are staying well with this COVID. It's never easy, but... Uh, Thank you for all you do. Uh, I'm not going to surprise you with a question that I've never asked before. I'm going to ask it again. And uh, if you could share with me on the contract that we have with the other communities and uh, when that comes mature and we can renegotiate. And secondly, what is the increase we're passing along? I always have an issue and I'm never going to stop having an issue. When you're asking for an 8% increase so with regards to the town portion, that I need to know that the it's going up 8% to what we charge the other communities. It doesn't seem fair that uh, the people of Midland pay the increase when other people are using the, the library. So can you assure me that that is indeed the, the, the case that uh, as of today, it's going up 2% to our other communities. And if we were to increase the new position, that it would go up 8%. Is that indeed true? Through you, your worship to deputy yeah. mayor um i knew this was coming this is a a, a a normal question and thank you yes um my family and i are doing well um so with regards to the contract with tiny we are still technically in a contract however um we have done a presentation in coordination with the town of penetang and the township of springwater to the township of tiny to change the funding model what we have asked for is rather than it be on a per household membership, so some years we get a certain amount, some years we get less, all depending on who signs up. Um, and you'll notice in our revenue for 2020, we took a hit because all the cottagers couldn't come up. Um, we've gone to them asking for more stable funding. So that would mean we would determine a number, which we're in the process of working with now, and we would get that number every year, whether one person from Tiny signs up or the same number signs up. Now, in that contract negotiations, we're also working to automatically get um, without negotiation, the cost of living increase gets applied no matter what. Then if anything else needs to be added, we would go back um, annually each year, but automatically there will be um, the cost of living applied. So we're right now working with them. Um, Tiny Council, it was very well received. It's easier for them planning knowing it's a set amount and the amount we're going in with is significantly more than what we had asked for or what we actually got in 2020 based on the per household signups. Um, this way we'll be able to plan properly and know what funds are coming in from the municipality. And that is to ensure that we are being more fair to our Midland taxpayers so that we know how much is coming from them. To, in prepping for this presentation, we also did a lot of research in what other libraries who have contracts with other municipalities get from those municipalities for their library service. What is standard in the province is that those libraries would get the, that municipality's amount of their public library operating grant. Um, we get significantly more than that from Tiny to the tune of about three to four times um, what the provincial average is when providing contracted service. So we are making sure that we are providing service, but also ensuring we're looking out for the bottom line for our taxpayers. Deputy Mayor. Thank you very much. Anytime. Thank you, Ms. Bergstrom. Uh, Councilor Gordon. Thanks for your presentation. I always enjoy your lively uh, all your presentation. It was a little glitchy on my end. I guess it was for everybody. It's just a Zoom phenomenon. Um, out of for 2020, what percentage of uh, that 
ghastly year were you guys forced to close the building to the public? I got a couple of questions, but this is like the first one because the other one kind of depends on this one. Yes, absolutely. Through you, your worship to uh, Councillor Gordon. So we were forced to close in March. Um, we started um, opening again for curbside in the summer and then we were reopened to the public in August and then forced to close to the public again right around Christmas. But we have been offering curbside consistently. So folks are still getting their library um, services and we are still doing online programming. Um, despite the fact that our program numbers went down a little bit during that transition where we didn't know what we were allowed to do, we've actually seen a 41% increase in program participation over the course of the year. So we're seeing more people participate and engage with the library than we had in the previous year when everything was in person. Um, so while the closures are not ideal, we are finding a way to reach out to those who can't come into the building. Okay, thank you. And if I could follow up, I worship it so I mean, I'm really one to talk because I mean, we didn't lay anybody off in Midland. We found other ways from the work. Um, you know, recently we had to, unfortunately, but uh, I'm just wondering, did you have to lay any of your staff off because the place isn't open and your, the services you were providing were a bit more skeletal and having to have like a security guard, for example, when there's nobody in the building but staff? Like, did you have to lay anybody off or did, were you able to save any money, I guess, because of this pandemic through government grants or subsidies or anything? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Gordon. Yes, actually, um, by the time the year end is wrapped up, we should save over $100,000 from our 2020 operating budget. While we didn't lay off any contracted staff, we do have, we had about nine staff who are either on call or student pages who technically have zero hours each week. Those people were not scheduled because we didn't need them. So while we weren't laying anybody off, um, we did save some funds that way. And we also had um, a long-term staff member just recently retire, so we're saving some funds there as well, um, while there was still some shuffling. But we were able to maintain everybody else who has a contract and maintain their contracted hours. We did a lot of professional development. That library is cleaner than it's ever been. And they're programming. Everybody is programming now. So it's not just the children's librarian and adult librarian and the maker place coordinator. Um, everybody is programming now, which is fabulous. Pastor Gordon. Oh, thank you. Oh, that's good. Thank you. Councilor Cunningham. Please. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, and thank you for coming today, Ms. Bergstrom. I know the drive in with kids is a challenge. <laughs> uh, beautiful presentation. Again, I have a question. I know that you have been positioning yourself more and more as a community hub, and that's something that I truly appreciate. I wondered how this marketing and communication staff would play into promoting beyond the library, some of those services, and if there is a plan for that. Yes, through you, your worship. Yes, um, there is a plan for that. So um, as you all know, we've been preaching, we're more than just books for many years now. And part of our 2020 initiatives were creating a new teen space, a dedicated teen space, which has proceeded throughout the year. This marketing and communications coordinator position would really help us engage with um, people of all ages throughout the community through various means. So right now we went from 125 programs to almost a thousand. With those programs, you have to do the marketing, you have to advertise them, you have to do all the prep work, all the background. That's a lot of work on the staff that we have. And what we're hearing from the community is they're like, oh, we didn't know that this was happening until we came in or we didn't see it and we didn't necessarily have the, the time to spend reaching out to all the groups we wanted to. So this person would also take on the initiatives of going more into the schools and into the community and into the seniors homes and attending these you know, community events and fairs. So they wouldn't just be sitting in an office. Um, most of our staff do not just sit in an office. So you would see them out in the community. Um, they would almost be like our mascot as well. Um, out there and really promoting and engaging and getting feedback from the community as well in terms of what's working, what's not working, what would you like to see, where else can we be to meet your needs. Um, and this is where having that great bookmobile also will come into play because wherever that bookmobile is, you know, they have Wi Fi and they'll have access to our team, including that marketing and communications coordinator who will be out and about. If I could follow up. Uh, you may have noticed, Ms. Bergstrom, that we are working through our seniors council around age-friendly communities, which with our seniors council, of course, is for our seniors. Um, but realistically, age-friendly includes all ages. And we are looking for opportunities to create pillars of uh, our community, our, our Chickamauk um, Ontario Health Team, the library, absolutely, um, 
community link that there are all these organizations that are out there saying, hey, we have information. Hey, we can get you connected. And they each have their little piece. So I'm always listening to see, is there a way? I know that we would love to see an age-friendly coordinator position in Midland or North Simcoe. But is there a way that this could overlap with that need in our region? Through you, your worship? Absolutely. I don't see why that wouldn't be a natural overlap. Um, we have the community connection space, we have the bookmobile, um, we have the means, and if we have this position especially, to be able to make those connections. And the library is should be the go-to place to help make those connections and to go to look for information. So I absolutely see that being on the table as being a great place to overlap. Further comments or questions from council? Council begin. Um, so I'm, I'm curious if there's um, <clears throat> if there's a way to to use some of our groups that have partnerships um, to use to to come to you know for instance I, I view I view library as culture um, but have you gone to have you gone to any other groups or agencies and ask them if they have any means of assisting with um, supporting, getting the news out, getting the information out. Um, and how has that gone? And is there anything that, um, that perhaps is, is in the works? Um, is there anybody perhaps in any of those groups that might be able to, um, to assist with, with um, grant finding and better ideas so that you know, in a fiscally responsible manner, everybody can work together. Through your worship to Councillor McGinn, that's an absolutely fair question. Um, so we do reach out a lot. We have many partnerships um, through the various organizations. Even um, Randy Fee at the town has been fabulous at adding our events to the calendar and help pushing them out on social media. Um, we've been using, utilizing those kinds of connections for the last few years. So since I arrived in 2015, our programs have gone up. Um, 700%. That's a huge increase to be able to try and push all of that onto someone else. Um, we've done what we can with our partnerships and with our in-house staff, and we're still obviously not meeting the need and the demand for the community to hear what we're doing. So we're happy to utilize this and share with others, but we're at the point of saturation with doing a thousand programs a year, plus maintaining the website and attending these events. It would be a lot to shove onto somebody else to be, while you're doing this, can you also make sure you're handling our organization? So we, we utilize partnerships where we can, but this has become so large now that we are really at that breaking point where we feel like we need someone to help take the, the brunt of the weight. And we'll still continue to utilize those partnerships going forward because we shouldn't, we should always be, you know, using each other's resources and helping each other out where we can. Thank you. Uh, last question, Councillor, and then we're going to have to move on, I'm afraid. Councillor Gordon. Okay, just in the elephant in the room. Um, you know, like you guys do amazing work. You got this 80% uh, reach, you know, which is like, that's, that's fantastic. But I guess the, the other side of that is, you know, we're, we're being asked to uh, finance an increase in marketing, which typically is used to not only continue to communicate with that 80%, but to try and reach the 20 that you're not um, getting to. So I'm just wondering, like in a year like now, without getting into the weeds of it, um, is it possible that, you know, we can do work smarter and work harder, which usually it's one or the other, but, you know, this is one of those years where I think we got to do both. And, you know, can you, can you continue and sustain your momentum, um, you know, hypothetically, if you didn't get that, that ask and keep up all the amazing stuff that you guys are doing? Through your worship to Councillor Gordon, that's an absolutely fair question. And we knew putting it out there, this is a rough time to ask. This is a position we know we needed since 2018. Um, the birth of the maker place kind of exploded everything for us. So this position is not only to increase the membership numbers, it's more to engage with everybody in the community, whether they're members or not. We want them utilizing all the services we have from wireless to maker place, those sorts of things. Rather active memberships can be people checking out books, but they might not realize all the other things going on or the other services that we can help them with. We can continue to try, but at some point we're at that, that saturation point where the staff are definitely working well beyond their job descriptions and they're getting to the point of burnout, especially when you add on this transition this year of taking on now 
it takes three times as long to do every program because you're now creating the program, doing the program, filming and editing and that sort of thing. So we will do our best to continue as much as we can, but um, knowing that it's not sustainable uh, and we can't continue to see increases. Um, we go over, uh, off memberships, but also engagements in all of our programs. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to have to call it to an end here for the presentation from the library. Uh, CEO Bergstrom, I, it was great to see you. Great to see Madison. And um, uh, continue the wonderful work and uh, enjoy your evening again. And thanks to the board chair as well. It's bold. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. And just so you know, um, sorry, Your Worship, I just want to let everyone know that the video and all of the presentations are going to be posted on our website as well for public viewing. Thank you, um, Madam Clerk. So uh, since I've got it wrong the last two times, who's our next presenter? Huronia Museum. Thank you. <laughs> I did get that one right. I should have said so. Okay. Uh, so we next we have the Huronia Museum, and I believe uh, Ms. Nahani Bourne, who's the uh, head of the museum, will be uh, presenting. Uh, we'll promote Ms. Bourne to the uh, the panel, please, and uh, we'll, we'll see what uh, what's going on at the museum. Welcome. Hi. Good to see you. <laughs> Good to see you too, Your Worship. Good evening, members of council, Your Worship. I'm really glad I don't have to speak to the airport because I know nothing about planes. So thank you. <laughs> so thank you very much for having us here this evening. I do have a slide presentation. I'm assuming I will be able to see it too. Uh, I believe Ms. Edgar will have that for you in a second. Very, very good. Well, thank you for having us this evening. It's been very interesting listening to the other presenters too. There we are. Oh, there we go. So I'll just let it go right into the next slide because obviously I am from Hiromi Museum, not from the airport, not from a library. We're good. Excellent. We had some great things happen in 2019 that we really wanted to capitalize on in 2020, but we just, well, I think we know what 2020 was all about. So we did acquire a group of seven painting under the Cultural Properties Act, which identifies that piece, that Arthur Lismer piece, as a piece of Canadian cultural property. So by um, thanks to the approval of the federal government, we now hold Canadian cultural property in our collection, along with a number of other pieces that have been designated Canadian cultural property, we became home to it. And in 2020, that was going to be our year to really build on the group of seven programming as it was an anniversary date for the group, but things did happen. But we continued in 2019 with all of those great programs like Glow in the Dark Easter Egg Hunt, our Christmas market and our day camp. We took on new partnerships with Good Morning Apocalypse, giving them a space for programming and, and administration. And uh, we developed new education programs. Now in 2020, we would have continued to build on all of those things. Um, but of course we know the world kind of changed last March for all of us. So what the museum did in 2020 to really take advantage and make the best out of a situation is what all museums did. Most museums in Canada will tell you they spend 80% of their time doing things so they can afford to do museum work 20% of the time. What the pandemic allowed Heronia Museum to do was to focus a lot on its collections and refocus its programming and reconsider a number of things. So if we go on to the next slide, please. Thank you very much. So in 2020, we closed down on the March break Monday, like everybody else. And we were allowed to open in phase two, which kind of caught us off guard. Not, not didn't really catch us off guard, but we didn't think that we would be a part of the phase two, but we're very proud to say that we could be open on June the 15th. And we were one of the very few museums who actually did open. We opened and had everything in place and were able to provide visitation services on June the 17th uh, for people. We went to a program where people could visit and interact with the museum every 30 minutes. They, uh, they came in their social bubbles or they came at prearranged times. Um, 
museum world did look very different in 2020, um, but we were there. We were a part of the tourism landscape as soon as we were able to be there. And uh, although our visitation in 2020 was at 10% of what it normally is, uh, this did allow for a lot of time to catch up with a lot of collections work. In the past year, our curator has caught up on back cataloging over 2000 artifacts. And in the world of museums, that's a massive, massive task. Um, in our three-year strategic plan, of course, what we didn't see, forecast at all was these world-changing events um, like a pandemic. So when we talk in our three-year strategic plan about increasing our financial capacity, what we're actually looking at is much more um, a, a better response to opportunities that present themselves and being ready to take them in hand. There were a number of COVID funds that were released for heritage organizations and in the tourism sector. And I'm happy to say that Hironi Museum took advantage of all of them uh, that we were able to access this past year in 2020. We probably leveraged about $200,000 in funds to keep ourselves open and operational and contribute to the tourism landscape, as well as continue the important museum work that we do without any interruption. We do have five full-time core staff at the museum, all of whom uh, were still employed throughout the, throughout the closure and throughout the summer season. And we changed our operations and focused much more on our museum work and rechanging and, re um, and revamping our programming, especially in the education department where we've now developed kits that goes in, go into schools. Thanks to a partnership with the Hironi Community Foundation and a grant that we received, we now have kids that go into schools, they stay there for one week, they come back, they uh, get isolated for a week before they go out to another one with new material, so everything is nice and safe. But we have been altering our programming also to meet COVID you know, things as well. We were able to employ, thanks to many of the grants from the federal government, we employed five students throughout the year, full time, and they were 100% funded. So that was a great contribution, a great relief to our budget in a year where our monthly revenues were down anywhere from 60% to 92%. That's what a tough year it has been for the museum. Um, but thanks to all of those grants and the supports from the different agencies and the different level of government to help keep the tourism industry moving, keep museums operating and doing what they need to do and to keep the economy moving, we were able to stay open and provide employment opportunities throughout the summer as well. Um, in our strategic plan, we also talk about being able to um, <sighs> increase our 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 organizational capacity and find new partnerships. We did do some partnering this summer with Peroni Historical Parts, uh, bringing some visitor, um, some materials to move visitors from St. Marie over to Heronia Museum. It's been a great partnership. We're always looking for new opportunities to move traffic around with other tourism um, attractions in the area. Um, but we do have a number of partnerships and we've taken a lot of our fundraising and tried to revamp it into new formats as well. Many of you are aware of our very popular uh, film series, which of course shut down and did count for about $90,000 of our annual revenue. Um, we had to move that to an online format. It is not near as profitable, but the important thing is, is that we are still engaging and keeping in communication with our regular film goers so that when things do return to normal, um, they don't forget us and they do return to those old fundraising streams that we've always had and they can continue to support Heronia Museum. It's those strong partnerships that we're trying to, our best to keep alive, keep strong and uh, to keep moving along so that when things do eventually return to normal, we can all be a part of uh, something good. We're also, um, when you look at, at marketing, um, we did focus our marketing on moving traffic internally because I know there was a lot of concern and hesitation with regards to travel coming from outside of our county. Um, one of the things that Heroni Museum is very strongly focused on though is what's going to happen once we do get through this pandemic, um, whether that's in six months, whether that's in 12 months or whenever that happened. 
the one thing that we can all say is that historically, after we have these world changing events, like we did with the Spanish flu, we have a time of economic growth, we have a time of um, robust spending and robust travel. And it's really important that when that time comes, we are ready for what's going to be coming to us in the tourism industry. So we are focusing on that. The things we do now with trying to get information out online, trying to move programs into classrooms virtually is all great. And it's a way to engage with our community and our museum users in the moment. But once this is over, we also need to focus on and be ready for that travel boom that we expect will happen. And I think that's something we really need to focus on in the tourism industry um, very strongly in the, in the coming years. Um, we're also trying to uh, in, increase our engagement and participation in virtual ways. If anybody was with us over the past year, perhaps you even yourself participated. We had a group of seven lookalike contest in the fall. I don't know if anybody got to see um, what came in, but we are really quite amazed what people can do with crayons. Uh, we challenge people to uh, replicate any group of seven painting either online or from our collection with crayons and submit it to us. They're all available on our Instagram account and on our, uh, on our webpage. So please do go and have a look. We had some really great submissions. Um, and again, it was a great way to engage with the community and remind them of what we are, what we have, and that we will still be here once travel is able to move again and people feel safe about moving. Could we maybe move on to the next slide, please? Uh, to one minute, please. Yep, absolutely. Okay, so the one thing I just wanted to, to say in 2021, we're going to continue to offer meaningful museum programming. Um, we still wanna, we, we are going to look for new ways to do that. Um, we do feel so, um, our ask this year, we have asked for 84,000 and depending on what we are able to leverage as usual, this will mean anywhere from 12 to 18% of our annual budget. Um, we are very hopeful that the different levels of government agencies and foundations will be considerate of what COVID means to heritage preservation institutions and museums, and that we will need their support and then we will continue to access funds at the level we were able to in 2020. So with that, I shall close off and just open up for questions. Thank you. Uh, council, comments or questions? Councillor Gordon, Councillor Main, uh, Councillor Gordon and Councillor Main. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, and more so, I wanna thank you guys, thank you for your letter. Like it's such a simple, succinct ask in our uh, budget draft for the people that uh, follow along. It's like page 135. I'd like to, if I could, just quote your words in this request of council. And, and this is what was submitted, it said, this also represents a 0% increase from last year's request. As we understand the budgetary challenges faced by all levels of government, businesses and all citizens in 2020. And I couldn't ask for a more succinct phrase to encapsulate what I'm gonna be looking for um, this year in our budget and how appreciative it is to see that in a request for, for money, continued funds, you know, which we've pledged to you and it's part of our agreement, but for you to, Put that succinct little statement in your budget request uh, means an awful lot to me and anyone who reads it because that's exactly the kind of um, doing more with less kind of uh, attitude that got people through that Spanish flu uh, and into those prosperous times that follow and uh, you know sadly we're not through ours yet there's probably going to be a third wave so the fact that you're planning for that and you are uh, trying to mitigate that and coming in with such a modest request um, I Personally, I really appreciate it. And the people that talk to me about their budget concerns truly appreciate it and continue to support you guys in your efforts. So bless you and uh, thank you for making my, my day when I read that, uh, that letter you sent. Oh, thank you. Councillor uh, Main. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I was, uh, one thing that's nice about the museum is unlike other places, the things inside of it increase in value with time. Uh, that's one thing that's quite fortunate with the museum. Uh, and I just want to say thank you because I know your collection is so vast and it's amazing. Uh, I, I really want to thank you for initiating the Group of Seven loaner program where you can loan the Group of Seven 
art in your home. That's just great. I just can't wait for mine. Uh, oh, sorry. Was that not announced yet? Okay, sorry. Um, sorry, all joking aside, I wanted to say thank you for the BIA pictures uh, with the downtown dig. We did put together a whole bunch of photos. And so that was great. Uh, just seeing lots of fun photos from uh, downtown, even some pictures from as recently as the 70s uh, are still cool to see, uh, you know, uh, the town in different historical settings. So I appreciate all the hard work that you guys do at the museum. And I know that we've been chatting a little bit over the last few months. And so very glad to hear that things are okay. Well, as good as they can be and that you're planning ahead. So thank you again for your presentation. Yep. Thank, you. Uh, thank you very much for the creative thinking that you and the team did and for, um, I would have been I would have been really surprised if there hadn't been a, you know a historical reference. So as soon as you were talking about the Spanish flu, I was like, yes, but not not. I'm happy that it happened, but that the reference was there because it's something we can all understand. Um, and I really appreciate that from the past, there is a thought process that you're applying to the present. You know, the whole boom bust is real. It's it's and to forecast that way and then to plan now and the way you got there. Um, so to keep those, you know, to have those students come in and have them fully funded, you know, the hello, fur baby, um, to, to um, you know, to have, to have students that were there and to have them fully funded, the process of getting funding is, it's paperwork. Um, I, I understand that, I get that. So thank you for everything that you did and thank you for a very concise and, uh, and short ask and a 0%. Thank you very much for that. And for everybody here, I, I remember being there when there was the picture, and Ms. Lenz was putting up the, 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 the picture. And I, I remember that. And it was incredible, um, you know, to have, to have that experience. And for me to personally say, I personally felt touched. You're something that is a gem to us. Thank you very much. Does anybody you. else wish to uh, engage Ms. Warren? Questions or comments? Seeing none, great to see you again. Good to and see you too, Your Worship. I wish you uh, all the best for the season. Hopefully uh, your predictions about COVID will be off by several orders of magnitude. We'll actually be able to do something when the summer rolls around. Oh, everybody cross your fingers Keep and everything else. Crossed. Thank you, yes. <laughs> all Thanks the best, again. everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. So, Madam Clerk, I think uh, uh, we have um, Councillor Hastings uh, representing on behalf of the Cultural Alliance. Yes, we have uh, Councillor Hastings as well as um, Karen Mealy. Ah, thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Hello. Welcome. Welcome to thank you both. You. Thank you. Uh, so the uh, rules of engagement are 10 minutes for a presentation, 10 minutes of questions. So we can uh, stay to that, we'll be, uh, we'll be ahead of the game. And I'm looking forward to your presentation as we are, all are. Oh, thank you very much. Well, good evening, your worship and members of council. It's, uh, it's really nice to see everyone. Um, if you, in case you don't know me, I'm uh, Cindy Hastings. I'm the new chair of the Cultural Alliance. And uh, of course, you know Karen Mealing, our amazing staff resource from the town of Midland. Um, thank you for giving us the time this evening. I'm going to quickly go um, highlight our 2020 accomplishments and then review our plans for 2021. Um, and I tried to include as much uh, information as I could in your agenda package. Um, next slide, please. So we celebrated our first year as a joint committee back in November. Um, hard to believe it's only been a year given the number of accomplishments by this committee. Next slide, please. We stayed true to our mission statement that was developed through a joint working committee of one council member and one staff member from each of our communities. Next slide, please. So this is our committee composition um, and we have a growing number of subcommittee members to support all our initiatives. Um, special thank you to Councillor Cher Cunningham, who is our vice chair and again, uh, Karen, Karen Mealing, who is our staff resource um, and for their dedication and their hard work on this committee. Next slide, please. Our committee is guided by our strategic priorities. They're listed here. Um, we've, excuse me, referenced these priorities on each of the initiatives that we are presenting to you this evening. Next slide, please. 
Yeah. So COVID, uh, we had just nicely gotten we just nicely gotten started when the pandemic hit. And uh, despite this, we didn't miss a meeting. Our very hardworking and dedicated committee members uh, managed to carry on with an impressive number of initiatives that supported our strategic priorities, uh, created new partnerships with other, with other organizations and secured additional funding. Um, so on this page, the cultural calendar events continued, although it was a little more sparsely popula populated than usual. Um, and our goal is to be the resource for all cultural activities in our area. Um, Karen also sends out a bi-weekly newsletter that's filled with information about upcoming events for residents um, and initiatives to support the creative community. So this is from other uh, partners in the area as well as our own initiatives. Um, and I, I believe you probably already receive it, but if you haven't signed up to get the newsletter, I'd encourage you to do that. Um, next slide, please. Um, you're probably familiar with Entrepreneur. So this is a program that helps creatives turn their art into business. Uh, we managed to get eight weeks in before the start of the pandemic. Um, and then the final four sessions took place in October, both uh, online and in person. Next slide, please. So Culture Days is a national celebration that they ran from September 25th to October 25th. Uh, what we did was put a call out to local organizations to submit proposals to help celebrate this event. And we are very pleased to support uh, modified programming efforts of the Chamber of Commerce, uh, Le Clay, Le Mieux, and the Midland Public Library. Uh, and we are in the process of reviewing applications for, the, for 2021 um, for the event running September 24th, 25th, and 26th. Um, 30 Days of Culture uh, happens through the month of September. Uh, we encourage residents to engage in one culture event each day and post on social media. Residents were entered into draws for their participation in this program. And this will again be a recurring event. Uh, the Cultural Alliance website acted as host for the four, municip four North Simcoe municipalities for a virtual Canada Day celebration. And uh, there were live, perf live performances and messages from our four mayors. We also launched an online cultural festival early in the pandemic to provide residents and local creatives uh, with an outlet to celebrate culture. And it ran for the months of uh, March, April, May, June, and July. Um, we offered uh, examples of online art performances and a small marketplace that directed customers to local businesses. Um, and finally, on this page, the Finding You in Culture campaign, this was conceived by Georgian college students at Treefort. Uh, the message through Finding You in Culture was to remind residents of the many ways that you participate in cultural activities. Residents were encouraged to take pictures and promote their activities through social media in order to win local prizes. Next slide, please. The Inspirational People's Banner Project uh, will recognize and celebrate contributions of 10 individuals that have made a significant impact in the five communities of the Cultural Alliance. Through a community nomination process, two individuals were selected from each community. Their images, names, and occupations specialty will be printed on large banners and hung in their respective communities. Uh, the, many, the winning submissions were recently announced and the banners will be ready for installation by the spring. And uh, we hope to repeat this in 2021. Next slide, please. So to identify us as a unique collaboration, uh, the one of its kind we know of in Canada, um, it, we created a logo that incorporates the elements from each of the community's logos, as well as aspects of their heritage and history. So the way and the waves at the bottom symbolize the connection of each community to Georgian Bay. Next slide, please. So the Creative Communities Culture Conference, this was a, this was a big initiative. Um, it was originally planned to take place uh, in person at uh, St. Marie among the Hurons. Um, so even though we had zero expertise uh, with online conferences, we felt it was important to give our creative community um, something during this time. So thankfully Rogers TV came on to uh, partner with us to cover the cost of the Zoom conference and also looked after uh, all the technical aspects. Uh, very fortunate too to have Fred Hacker drive many aspects of this initiative too. Um, the theme of the conference, obstacles and opportunities, finding the path to success focused on how as a creative or a cultural organization, um, you could adapt during the pandemic and thr even thrive uh, by finding opportunities you hadn't previously considered. Um, took place over eight evenings during the month of November and included our keynote speaker, Catherine Nichols and 15 guest speakers plus moderators to the balance of the conference. Um, so very, very well received. Um, uh, excellent caliber of uh, topics and speakers and this conference will be made available to the attendees and also uh, is being broadcast on Rogers TV. Next slide please. 
So on to our initiatives for 2021. Um, so cultural connections for individuals and organizations uh, was planned for 2020, but we weren't able to continue due to the pandemic. So these networking opportunities will be offered uh, online until uh, we're able to offer them as in-person events. Um, also originally planned for 2020 were uh, cultural enhancements to existing events in each of the five communities. And we've already put out a call for applications and we're currently in the process of reviewing these. Next slide, please. So this is a new initiative, uh, Be a Tourist in Your Hometown. So basically a cultural shop local campaign uh, designed to encourage our own residents to take advantage of the wealth of attractions, businesses and dining opportunities in our communities. And we're partnering with uh, EDCNS on this project and this will take place uh, May 28th, 29th and 30th. Next slide, please. Uh, the Living History Project is being undertaken by our Cultural Heritage Committee and a big part of uh, this rich heritage comes from stories of our past. So the group is creating a series of video interviews to capture all these stories. And um, this will eventually be a component of our next project, which will be the largest and most important undertaking, I think, by the uh, Cultural Alliance. Next slide, please. So the cultural asset database and map will be the foundation for what we do going forward. And through this exercise, we will identify cultural assets through our five communities. So these can include things like local artists, cultural organizations, industries, spaces, um, facilities, events, um, cultural heritage and natural heritage, also things, um, intangible assets like storytelling. Um, well, we were prepared to try and do this on our own, uh, we were very lucky, thanks to Karen's grant writing skills, um, to receive $75,000 through OTF. So that enabled us to hire Stantec as a consultant on this project. Um, so they'll be responsible for helping us collect the data, creating the database, and the map in um, ArcGIS, which is a system that we, um, each of our municipalities use. Um, so there'll be many opportunities for community engagement through surveys, interviews, and events. Um, and one of the commitments as part of the grant is to hold five community events to capture this information. So due to the pandemic, we're going to have to do things in reverse. Um, Stantex helping us um, collect some data now, and then hopefully later on in the year, we'll be, we'll be able to do these, um, hold these events and, and share this information with the communities. Um, so this is something that's very, very important that we, we keep current. Um, so the plan for 2022 and beyond is to hire a summer student to help uh, keep this going. One minute, please. Yep, uh, if I could please bring in Karen to quickly talk about a uh, brand new initiative um, that's uh, coming next week. Thank you, good evening, everyone. Uh, one thing that the Cultural Alliance is now sponsoring that was not prepared before the, this presentation is Clayton King is doing a three-part series of virtual workshops starting on Tuesday night. It's the Anishinaabek Doodle Mag. Uh, so it's exploring the Doodle Mag clans and families of the Anishinaabek in the Southern Georgia Bay region. It's a free workshop to anyone. Uh, they're taking place in the evenings. We will be recording these, so if you are unable to attend all the sessions, you'll be able to find them on the Cultural Alliance. And uh, if you're looking interested in more information, I can email it to you and the direct link for registrations. Great. Thanks, Karen. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so just very quickly, we've been able to secure uh, money in 2020, OTF, County of Simcoe sponsorships, ticket sales, and I know Karen's working on some other initiatives uh, with County of Simcoe. Next slide, please. And if I could just uh, please ask for your continuing support um, with a contribution of $10,000. And we'd really like to keep Karen because we, uh, we certainly couldn't do this uh, work without her. Um, so anyways, thank you again for your time. And I, I really hope I've done the committee justice um, through this presentation and uh, looking forward to working with you um, in 2021. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hastings. Uh, I'm quite impressed at all the information you're able to uh, just off, off the cuff present. It's uh, a lot of things going on. Thank so thanks for the presentation. I'll open it up to council for comments or questions, please. Councillor Main. That, that, this is just great. That was a great presentation. Yeah, I think Karen is fueled on butter tarts. So I think if you just, <laughs> things like 10,000 butter tarts for the year, I think that's what her going rate is. Um, but this culture stuff is just great. And I think this was, you guys have done such a great job. Uh, the team has done such a great job by creating all these virtual uh, events. Uh, and I know the entrepreneur, you know, that's exactly what we're trying to promote is the creative uh, economy 
And so you give people the, the, the skills to be able to kind of monetize their art skills. So obviously culture is not the same as tours event, tourism and special events. Uh, and I know that you guys are looking at maybe doing a couple little special events to complement the cultural stuff. Is that something that you, uh, is that the home of special events in going forward is, is under the cultural Alliance uh, umbrella or the banner, or is that just one of the many partners that we can partner with uh, for cultural stuff? Um, yep, thank you. Um, through you, your worship to Councillor Main. Um, I, I don't, I think we can have a further conversation about that. I think, um, yes, it, it, Certainly a lot of, a lot of uh, events that we put on could go through the Cultural Alliance. Um, and we're certainly trying to um, help uh, boost and, and support the existing events now. So um, yeah, I think I'd like to see more of that. And, and as you saw in our presentation, we're also partnering with um, EDCNS to, to help with, uh, with uh, tourism, that, that component. Cause you're right, it's not, it's not uh, culture isn't just tourism. Um, so yeah, I think there's lots and lots of opportunities that we can explore going forward for sure. I hope oh, that answered your question. <laughs> yes, it does. Thank you so much. And then I guess the other question that has come up before, or I guess last year as well. Uh, so was the Midlands cultural plan, is the home of it also now with this alliance? Um, because this, this is a great organization. You guys have been able to do great, great partnership. It's just now that Midland was a little bit ahead of doing some cultural planning. And so it just, that's a great document that we just don't want to see, uh, you know, uh, stall out, if you will. Yeah. So, so the, this alliance was formed based on, on all that work that, that the town of Midland had done. But through that document, it was discovered that um, culture doesn't know any, any boundaries, right? So it needed to expand to, to um, North Simcoe and beyond. So that's, that's how we got to where we are now. Um, so we're, we're, we're working backwards a bit. We're using the document, but we're also going back and doing this cultural asset mapping so that we can really um, know exactly what we, what we have. And then maybe from there, we can update the document that was originally done by the town of Midland for, for the whole area. Well, thank you so much. We have so many great cultural assets. So this is a, that's a big Herculean task. So thank you so much. Thank you. I could just comment on that too. The um, Midland Cultural Plan recognized up front that there are no boundaries with respect to culture, that the interplay between the various, no political boundaries, uh, and that uh, it was in the best interests to develop it to a point and then try to take it to the next level, which is uh, what's happening now with the Cultural Alliance. So just by way of some perspective there. Uh, I think we have Deputy Mayor, or, Councillor Shesky, you wanted to say something, didn't you? Yes, please. Councillor Shesky, and then I have Deputy Mayor Ross. Thank you very much. Thanks for the presentation. That was great. Uh, any discussion of tourism and uh, visitors is, uh, and events is refreshing at this time. So uh, that's greatly appreciated. I also want to say that's a great logo. Uh, I, I love the logo a lot. When the uh, Culture Alliance merchandise comes out, let me know, and uh, I'll be the first one to have the hoodie. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, just want to say thanks. Great job. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mayor. Thank you very much, Your Worship. Through you, uh, I want to thank Councillor uh, Hastings for coming and, of course, Miss Mealing. Always a pleasure. And uh, this is one of the things that always uh, excites me. I, I love when we can all we, when four municipalities plus our First Nations can get together and, and, and do things. It really is the key to our, our growth and our, our success in, in North Simcoe to have four four plus one, uh, I apologize, five, five uh, different uh, communities get together and, and do things. And to me, it's, uh, it, it really is amazing to see. It's a great organization. I thank you very much. Uh, thanks go to Mr. Hacker for uh, starting it. And uh, it truly is. And I want to also thank you. My favorite number is always zero, no increase with regards to ask. So, um, you're, you're making me happy so many ways tonight. So thank you so much. And uh, hopefully we can continue this. And uh, I'm always for more, more. If we can always do more as a group and uh, as a North Simcoe community, we're, to me, we're always much better uh, together than we are apart. So thank you very much. And uh, keep up the good work, ladies. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks uh, for the uh, great presentation. I 
I do embrace uh, right from when we first saw the presentation with uh, you guys and, and uh, Mr. Hacker. Uh, this is a, a pittance, really. What you guys do with 10 grand is incredible. Um, and again, impressed the fact that you come back to us uh, with the challenges and all this neat stuff that you want to do uh, for the same money as last year. So right on. Something that came up, uh, well, you, I'm sure you've heard about it, the, the UNESCO application that we're entertaining. Um, and as you know, it's way bigger than Midland Bay Landing. It's something for North Simcoe and maybe even beyond North Simcoe. That is culture and tourism in a nutshell. And I'm just wondering whether you've given any thought or if there's been any uh, murmur amongst yourselves, whether that would make the most sense to, to move that into your lap and out of our Midland Bay Landing Development Corporation's hands and put it in the hands of the five municipalities that ultimately would be the beneficiaries of a designation if we're successful and put all your talent to work and let our EC, EDC and S, I know it's in our conversation, well, not EDC and S, sorry, but um, Middle Bay Landing guys do what they're supposed to be doing, which is development and, and whatnot. Have you guys talked at all about taking on that that uh, role or playing a, an active role in it? Oh, thank yep, thank you for the question through you, Your Worship. Um, we actually just had a presentation um, by um, at our last meeting, actually, about the UNESCO project. So we were very, very excited and, and hope to play a big role. Um, to be honest, we hadn't actually thought about taking it over, but uh, we were we were super excited about uh, being involved in that because that 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 really is what we're all about, right? Um, so, yeah, no. Uh, where I think everybody was 100% on board with uh, with with working with this project, but we can we can discuss the, the how much maybe maybe uh, later on. Oh, right on! I just just an off the cuff thing because it just seemed to gel so much with your mission, and it's an, I don't know why I never even considered it before. But anyway, thank you much for your presentation, and uh, when the time comes, uh, you know you'll have my support for this ten thousand dollar ask. You guys are thank doing you. amazing things with it. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, any further questions or comments from council? Seeing none, uh, I'd just like to mention that there is a significant amount of funding, which I believe Ms. Mealing is aware of from at the county. It's twice, they took 2020's funds and rolled into 2021. And I'd also like to acknowledge the work that was done on the Ontario Trillium Foundation application, because if I'm not mistaken, it's a stepping stone pending the success and meeting the objectives of what I believe is a seed grant to another much larger uh, potential grant uh, down the road. Uh, and so uh, marvelous job on that and all the things that you've been doing. I would say that to Councillor Gordon's question about uh, Geopark, I think really what's going on at uh, Middle Bay Landing is a uh, taking the opportunity to take the initial steps and then when the report comes out, if, if it's anything for what like I've seen with other geoparks, it's going to expand to the point where they'll be looking for somebody to take it over. So I don't think they just particularly want to keep it there. They just wanted to start the process. So uh, I may be speaking out of turn, but I don't think so. Thank you for a, uh, a fabulous job. I know you've got, you just keep building and building. I was really pleased to hear that Clayton King is still participating. I'd heard he had moved, but apparently not that far, I guess. And uh, I'm glad he's still around uh, to to help out with uh, with everything on the committee. And to, uh, thanks to everybody who's volunteering in the committee as well, because I know there are a lot of people who are putting their time in. So wonderful job. Uh, the leveraging of uh, uh, always makes Deputy Mayor uh, Ross happy. Uh, multiples on the dollar spent and all that stuff. So great job. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening and, and stay safe. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, with, we are now at our last presentation for the evening. Uh, it's the Economic Development Corporation of North Simcoe. Uh, Ms. Sharon Bay will be presenting. And uh, if you can promote her to panelists, please. And load a slide deck, if I'm sure there is one. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. And regarding the slide deck, I am going to be very quick with my images. So please have your fingers ready because I have a lot of images to show, but not a lot to say about them. <laughs> so uh, good evening, uh, Mayor Strathern and Midland Council. And I'm going to present our achievements in 2021 a little bit. 
and our our plans for our achievements in 2021, yes, since uh, January and 2020, and our plans for funding request, which is $168,814. That is in our in our projected budget. And it's the same amount as it was last year. Next, please. This is the current EDCNS board complement. Next slide, yeah. At our May 2020 annual general meeting, we gained three new board members, Alex Loren, Ted Salisbury, and Adrian Sofajo. Next, please. Councillor Cher Huntingham is the Town of Midland board representative, and she plays a major role in a lot of our activities, as does uh, Cindy, who you just met, which is, of course, merges with our tourism activities. Next, please. I will present what uh, we leveraged in 2020, including tourism achievements accomplished by Melissa Elsden, who has been with us now for a year. Next. In, 20, in 2014, uh, the four of us, uh, in 2014, there was one staff at EDCNS, and now there are three of us. Plus, we are we have just put an application for three summer students, so we've grown quite large since 2014 when the mayor set us up. Next, please. We leveraged funding with the Tourism Industry Association grant of twenty four thousand, and we put on a taste shop experience program for tourism in the heart of Georgian Day, Bay, and that is continuing into 2021. It's a very good program for business retention and expansion. Next, our, uh, our participating businesses of the Taste Shop Experience, as you can see, are many, even more than listed here. Next, our work plan, the work plan for tourism includes a digital version of the discovery guide, which has received really high acclaim in the tourism industry. Even the County of Simcoe is so very proud of it. It's, it's a wonderful guide. We will have some print copies as well. And the Taste Shop Experience, which supports local businesses and partnering with culture and the town of Midland, as you've just seen the presentation, so wonderful. And, by the way, I'm up next for any image of their logo that they decide to send out. Next, please. Our plans for 2020 were certainly transformed to create opportunity and recovery from the challenges the economy began to put in front of us in the spring of 2020. Next. Nurse Simcoe has experienced positive job growth since 2014 when we started. And although we are in a negative health situation right now, many North Simcoe employers remain actively seeking employees. We are, we are a very dynamic community with a lot of people working together to make things happen. Next, please. As 2020 began, we were ready to ignite our marketing which uh, we have won many awards for. Every year we win awards. This past year was for the Agriculture and Agri-Food Economic Profile. Next, please. Our transformation to business retention and expansion began with the launch of a business recovery program, which other Ontario municipalities replicated as a model for recovery. Next. Extensive local media coverage included the outcome of our survey to businesses on their recovery plans who indicated North Simcoe is open for business. A positive spin. Next, an EDCNS Economic Development Municipal Task Force was created. We held town halls with our partners, the county warden, local MP and local MPPs, and the business and community organizations. Next. These discussions open communications amongst all our municipalities, all levels of government, our local associations to keep providing timely updates to support our business. 
and we continue to work with Georgian College on the Manufacturing Skilled Trades program. We, we work with them to support their marketing of the program and to get new um, trades people in next. The I Love My Local campaign ran, ran in the summer and fall, supporting business retention, a radio media promotion for 60 days on the DOC 104.1 FM was, was created. This was a lot to do with Cher's work. Thank you, Cher. A new program is planned for 2021. Local business sponsored the program with over 15 outstanding awards worth $2,000 up to $2,000 each and awards to influencers and a video was released and will be sent to the town of Midland Council. Next, we held an appreciation dinner and many of you were there. Thank you for attending. That was in March. We Live It, You Love It program, which delivered over 40 videos weekly about our businesses. And uh, th these were presented to you last November and are available on our dedicated YouTube channel and on our, our EDCNS website. So you can see them there if you wish. Next. I applied to an international organization, the IEDC, International Economic Developers Council, and we were the recipient of this honor amongst thousands of entries for this program. The award acknowledges the program through international eyes as well to attract investment because it markets the town of Midland across the globe, the USA and Canada. Next. We engaged OMAFRA to work with us to run focus groups. As you can see, there are four indicated here. We joined it in with the County of Simcoe and we covered the entire county with these focus groups. So we work closely with the county and as Mayor, Mayor Strathern knows, he is on the Economic Development Subcommittee, very involved with that. So we work with the county and always in line with they're deliverable, so we don't cross cross requirements and do a very efficient job. The county um, has received their draft economic work plan, which I will be sending to our board next week, and it, and it will be approved by or presented to the county of Central Council very soon. Next, in 2020, we began rebranding. A follow-up to our Invest Canada Community Initiatives Grant, which we launched in 2021. And this is an example of the EDCNS logo and the Farm Fresh logo in the image of the recent farm crawl. And by the way, the letter that I sent to you regarding budget funding was the very first one that included our new branding. Next. Um, Directed by community input, the vision for our 2021 recovery plan is recover, rebuild, and renew. EDCNS will support the development of conditions that enable a strong recovery from COVID-19, ensuring our business community remains resilient and thrives and positions North Simcoe as a top destination for tourism, culture, and value-added investment. Our scorecard for business retention and expansion in 2020 was 40%, but became 80% of our programming as we recover, rebuild, and renew. Investment in traction was 60 and became 20% of our scorecard for key performance indicators. The 4060 focus is now 8020, a clear change in economic priorities. Once board approved next week, our 2020 work plan, 2021 work plan will be shared with the, with the Town of Midland Council. Next. In 2021, we merge with tourism and industry pillars as they are converging sectors. Our budget of 240,000 for programs is across all industries. And as I mentioned, our ask to the Town of Midland is the same as last year, a 0% increase of the municipal tax levy, which is $168,814. Next, 
As a refresher, I'll provide you a brief summary of funding since we began in 2014. The County Simcoe funded EDCNS with 432,000 startup capital, including 32,000 from the four municipalities with the intention of gradually reducing county funding while the municipalities add funding. County financial support ended in 2018. In addition to grants from federal and provincial programs, we have operated with revenue from the four nursing municipalities in 2019 and 2020, fully from the, the four Midland Penitentiary and Tiny in the last two years. And we thank you for your confidence and support of EDCNS. Of the total $405,469 of municipal funding we are requesting, the Town of Midlands amount is 168,814. And uh, I, next please. I wish to thank you for your continued support of economic development and tourism, healthcare and manufacturing in, in North Simcoe. And I certainly welcome your comments and, and questions. Thank you, Ms. Bay. Uh, great to see things uh, moving along, uh, particularly with uh, the way COVID's been going, the efforts of uh, ADCNS in partnership with the chamber and uh, BIA in, uh, in the local area, as well as federal and provincial uh, representatives and getting the message out on funding, et cetera. Um, council, uh, County Council will receive the uh, EDO five-year stra strategic plan uh, early, I think it's the 9th of March, and uh, we expect that it will be approved and then uh, just ready for distribution more, more broadly. With that, uh, I see Councillor Gordon, who I saw some other, another uh, Councillor Cunningham and Councillor Shevsky. Thank you very much, uh, sir, and for that. And in, just in reference, I did email um, asking to see if we can get a copy of the financials for this year. I would hope to have them before um, you know this meeting, but I understand that just with timing and stuff, it has to go to their board. But uh, thank you for your commitment to share those with uh, myself and the rest of the council when they're available. Um, I think it's critical to note that Midland specifically, and of course our neighbors need your efforts um, more than ever as we migrate hopefully to a post pandemic world uh, yeah. in the next year or two. And quite simply the caliber of the work that you, the rest of uh, the board and your, and your volunteers and your staff do supported by the incredible media that you produce. But I gotta tell you is top tier and I can totally see why you guys win awards. It's absolutely tier one. Um, the fact that you've been able to hold to a 0% increase, despite all that you know we're going to ask of you, all that you know the communities are going to be asking of you and expecting you to help them with in the coming couple of years, is uh, nothing short of admirable. And uh, so I just want to personally thank you. It's just lovely to see. I don't have to go on the offensive, defensive or anything. This is a 0%. I know we didn't even ask you for that. But uh Thank you very much. You make it really easy. And uh, the power of four is a no brainer. There's just no way to argue it. It's uh, what we need. And, and please continue to do the amazing stuff you guys do. And, and Councillor uh, Cunningham made sure that she attended, you know, pre COVID and uh, got me one of those license plate. Uh, oh, good. For, for my license plates. So I was driving around with, with it uh, for as long as I could before I put the car away for the winter. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Cunningham. Thank you, Your Worship. And thank you for coming to present this mistake. I was wondering if you could speak to uh, something. The pandemic was such a shock to our businesses across the board, as well as to our economic development offices. And a lot happened as we got collaboration across the board. There have been amazing opportunities for you to work with other EDOs, other associations, as you all join together to face this pandemic and, and stare it down. Can you share some of that with the council here tonight? Well, uh, through you, uh, Mayor Strathern. Yes, thank you, Councillor Cunningham. What has happened? I always see that um, opportunities in problems that we face and, and I can imagine 
during other pandemics, how people came together to support one another and, and you really get a different sense of being and what is important. And that is what I found through going through this pandemic with the other economic development offices, with the County of Simcoe, with Culture Midland, with the Heronian Airport, with, with tourism, with everyone involved. They, everyone is ready to pitch in, to help out and to make things better. And, and it's really heartwarming. And, and that's the message that I can provide and particularly also that you you yourself share, mm, Councillor Cunningham, <laughs> have engaged the MP and MPP. So they we have engaged them before, but now they are really closely knit part of what we're doing and uh, friends. Councillor Shevsky, or follow on Councillor Cunningham. Councillor Shevsky. Thank you, Worship. Yeah, it's extremely challenging time to be promoting businesses and uh, businesses are having to adapt. Uh, we've had a few um, businesses just start to open up during this challenging time. Uh, at least two cannabis dispensaries uh, since COVID has started and uh, we have a third one opening in, uh, hoping to open in the spring downtown. I'm just curious, are we doing anything to help uh, promote these businesses coming to town? It's a brand new industry to the world, well, to the country anyway. Uh, it's definitely a brand new industry to Midland. Uh, they're obviously uh, fighting an uphill battle in terms of stigma, uh, aging population. Um, just curious if we're doing anything around that to help uh, a brand new industry in town. And also further to that, is there any talk being done around uh, cannabis related tourism? Uh, Niagara Falls does um, great wine tasting tours and uh, craft beer has become uh, a cult following in the last little while. Uh, has there been any discussion on uh, maybe marketing that the grass is greener in Midland? <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you, uh, Councillor Ocheski. Yes, uh, regarding welcoming new businesses to town, we've had uh, plenty of discussions very recently about giving, making stronger engagement with them through actually um, through government elected officials like yourselves can can play a major role in that as well. And, and that is part of our plan to welcome them with, with open arms. That's really what creates a community and keeps them here. Now, regarding the green fields, that question, uh, we have a board meeting next week and I'm gonna pose that question to tourism. <laughs> Are there any other comments or questions from council? This day. Councilor May. Uh, thank you for that presentation. Uh, that was great to see that uh, you to see us rapidly adapted. I know you guys had lots of Zoom meetings in March and April and May trying to figure out what we're going to do. So I think that was fantastic that adapting towards the business retention and expansion. Uh, so just generally, uh, how are our businesses doing? We know some of them are doing well. Some of them that are selling consumables, ones that sell food, that's great. Are factories doing okay, uh, just generally? And obviously, uh, is that something that you can speak to with some of the survey knowledge that you have about what the types of businesses in our town that are struggling? Well, it, in general, of course, uh, the retail businesses, when they have these shutdowns, that's a struggle, but they've really transformed themselves. And, and I personally see very amazing new opportunities for the way that we can buy curbside, it's much more convenient. And, and they are becoming digital as well. So there, there's a lot of digital programs available. One was just announced for funding and there were prior ones. So this can help the businesses. Actually in the longer term, I think it's, it's a positive outlook that we can see. And um, no, uh, as, as you saw my, open for business article there, the survey, well, those who responded, those who didn't respond may likely not have been open so they couldn't respond. So it's a little biased, but the survey gave a, a positive 
positive feeling that business will be good and will continue. And But that's mainly because of this community, how they support one another. Thank you. Um, any further questions or comments from council? Seeing none, I'd, I'd just like to go back to uh, something that was a driver a few years ago and just see what, if anything has changed. Um, uh, sorry, um, talent attraction in, in the uh, in the trades in particular um, is is identified as one of the, uh, the, the primary issues for uh, the EDO out of the county. I, know, I remember that we had at one point about 200 skilled trades positions in town that remain to be filled. Um, and I'm wondering if that's still the case. And, and, and the other thing that seemed to be, no matter where you went, people were having a hard time finding people to work in retail, to work in uh, just, just either general labor, so on. Is that still the case? And if so, uh, is that how... I, and I know that the EDO at County is starting to align itself to really deal with that, you know, ancillary issues like housing, where do you house people in the service sector and so on. Well, um, that, thank you, Mayor Strathern. Yes, that that is still an issue. And it has, I think, always been an issue and something that's very difficult to overcome. But we did create four strategies and that's part of our work plan and one of them was to attract and retain new and regional residents to improve availability of labor force and increase local spending capacity and and also to to create suitable housing options that was is a sub sub point of one of our strategies so we are looking at all of this very seriously and that is what you mentioned is actually how we will grow and it's a, a challenge but as you know the county is working on it as well and we support them 100 thousand percent in in that endeavor i hope that answers your question it does. I, I thank you. I mean, it's it's um, I, for all those who might be watching on YouTube tomorrow. Uh, there's there are a fair number of people who will be retiring from our manufacturing base uh, in the next five to eight years. Tremendous opportunity and skilled trades uh, for our young people uh, coming out of school to stay right in Midland, enjoy the, the stay with your friends, your family, a great uh, place to work live and play. So uh, yeah, I think that the more we can put that message out there for young people through your efforts in the county, the better off it would be. So uh, Councilor Cunningham. If I can just get um, Ms. Mrs. Begg uh, to, I'm not sure what the address is, but we just created an amazing video about live, work and play in this region that does promote exactly that. So if you could share yeah. that or point people to it, that would be valuable. Absolutely. I'll put it in our in the, the message, our next EDO report to council. Put the link. Thank you. So uh, I appreciate your waiting uh, in, in, in the waiting room as long as you did. And uh, I really appreciate the presentation. I think we all do and the work that you're doing. And uh, hope you have a, a, a great evening uh, that you'll stay safe. And we're looking forward to some pretty amazing things. Uh, from all the presenters tonight, and uh, thanks, thanks to uh, to you for your uh, high quality of work that you continue to do. And uh, again, we look forward to that through 2021 and beyond. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Our pleasure. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Good night. Good night. Well, Council, that uh, was a wrap for the um, agency's boards and. Uh, Missions. So I'm. Uh, I think we're probably all about ready to uh, go back and study our binders for the next upcoming meeting, but probably not tonight. Uh, so I wish you all a great, great evening, and uh, I'll, I'll put a motion on the floor by Deputy Mayor Ross, seconded by Councillor McGinn, 
that bylaw 2021-4 being a bylaw to adopt the proceedings of the special meeting of council held February 11th, 2021 be passed and enacted. Uh, all those in favor. Thank you. That's unanimous. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Uh, and I will, a, a motion moved by uh, Councillor Downer, seconded by Councillor Cunningham, that this special meeting of council adjourn at 20, sorry, uh, 8 19 p.m. All in favor? Thanks. Again, be well, stay safe, and uh, see you next Wednesday. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone.